I call the honourable member, Carol Beaumont. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, there's been some very good contributions uh, on this bill already, and uh, as my colleagues have said, Labor supports this bill. There are some very important and difficult issues that uh, the Select Committee, in considering it, will need to consider. Um, before I talk about the bill specifically, I just do want to acknowledge the work of my colleague, the Honourable Phil Goff. Um, Phil outlined a little of the work that he's done in this space, but as he was leaving the chamber earlier, he referred to, uh, to the fact that uh, he, at times prior to the earlier legislation, had lain awake at night worried about what might happen with some of the individuals that are covered um, now by these extended supervision orders that weren't at that stage uh, in place. And that was because the crimes that those individuals were likely to commit were of such a horrific nature. And uh, as a very responsible member of parliament, he was very concerned and troubled by that. He obviously has put a lot of work in over many years in this area, and I just think that's worth putting on the record the work of the Honourable Phil Goff. So, as I say, this bill flows on from the work that Phil Goff has undertaken. And we do have some concerns around uh, some of the matters in this bill, particularly uh, in regards to the definitions used for violent crime, but um, that will be no doubt considered in the Select Committee. So, as has been already outlined, the bill amends the Parole Act in as far as it relates to extended supervision orders, which are used at the moment to manage a small number of child sex offenders who pose a high risk of causing serious harm after being released from prison at the end of their sentence. Um, and this bill will enable orders to be renewed as often as they are needed. Uh, and certainly my understanding is that in one particular case, a person covered by one of these extended supervision orders um, understands enough that he himself is a risk to the community when his current order expires and would seek to um, make a submission to that effect to the select committee. Um, it also, the bill also then uh, changes the legislation to the extent that it also then moves on to include higher risk sex offenders against adults, and we're talking about a small number apparently, and very high risk violent offenders. And that's the area we have flagged up um, as the Honourable Phil Goff has said, some concerns that will need to be looked at in Select Committee. Um, it is a part of an area of uh, how we manage particularly high-risk offenders. In, in the, uh, I was interested to read in the regulatory impact statement uh, that the highest risk offenders, there's currently, or well, this there's three main areas in, in how we as a country try and manage that very, very difficult situation. There's preventive detention, um, which is effectively a lifetime sentence, um, and there's the current extended supervision orders that this bill seeks to amend, and then uh, there is uh, going to be uh, public protection orders as well, and they all play slightly different roles, but all have in common a primary purpose of protecting the public from further serious sexual and or violent offending. So that's the, the kind of common thread throughout them. And this bill really is looking at a gap where somebody who's been on an extended uh, supervision order post-release is coming to the end of the current period and the need to be able to um, further uh, put orders in place. Now, as my colleague Andrew Little said, there, there are some provisions in the bill to try and uh, get the balance right, because one of the difficulties we face uh, as legislators is the fact that, uh, as legislators, is the fact that the Attorney General under the New Zealand Bill of Rights um, has indicated that this bill is inconsistent with the New Zealand Bill of Rights, and um, he says so because of the imposition of retroactive penalties and double jeopardy. 
double jeopardy. That, these are serious matters, and so this will mean the Select Committee will need to look very, very carefully at the provisions in this bill and get it right. But as others have said, uh, we have traversed this ground previously, and I'm confident that it is not beyond the ability of this House uh, in this particular sort of circumstance to get it right and to do what is in the best interests of the public and in particular of children in New Zealand. Um, I do just want to take the opportunity at a more general level uh, to talk about the issue of violence and particularly uh, sexual and domestic violence because there is no doubt that we have a significant problem in this country. And it's one that uh, is currently under quite a lot of scrutiny. We've had the Glen Inquiry report into domestic violence. Uh, we've had the Family Violence Death Review Committee report just last week. Uh, we've had some announcements from the government uh, just this week, and certainly um, Labor will be making some significant announcements in this area. There is a serious problem with a violent culture. And while the bill that we're talking about covers a very severe situations um, and offenders who are you know, at extreme risk of uh, causing damage to the public, particularly children, it is interesting the context in which that happens, and I can't help but wonder if some of those people are part of what we know to be that intergenerational cycle of abuse, the damage that is done to our children. Um, not only by abuse of them directly, but also as witnesses of violence in their family. And 72 children were in their home in the period that the Family Violence Review Committee was reporting on, which was a th three-year period, 2009 to 2012, in their home when either a sibling or a parent was killed by another member of their family. Now, you can only begin, I'm sure members in this House, sorry, not you, sir, members in this House can only begin to imagine the damage that that would do to a child. And all of the evidence says that, in fact, that damage is possibly worse, is probably worse than the damage of the physical violence to that child themselves, which is quite interesting, the psychological damage. So I, I just say that. And Note that it is overwhelmingly women and children who are the victims of domestic and sexual violence in this country. And we do need to make sure that we take that matter and finally start to address it. We need to be world leading in this area. And our statistics are appallingly bad. And to be frank, one death, one rape, is one too many. But we do need to look at issues around prevention, issues around how we provide support and services to those who have been victims of violent crime, particularly sexual and domestic violence, and how we hold the perpetrators of the, that violence to account. But we can't do any of those in isolation from the others. And certainly the announcements this week by the government seem to focus very much in the criminal justice end and not so much in the prevention end. And it seems obvious, doesn't it, that we should actually try and stop the crime rather than being the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and dealing with the consequences of the crime, either the consequences to the victim or dealing with the perpetrator of the crime. So I just say that we need to be much more aware of what we can do to change, and pr change the violent culture that we have in this country and to prevent sexual and domestic violence from occurring. And it is a human behaviour, so we should be able to change it. Maybe not ever completely eliminate it, but certainly seriously reduce the, the incidents that we currently have in this country. So it has got those three elements. Uh, it needs real leadership and it needs real commitment. This is not something we can do overnight, but it is something that, as a parliament, we need to address. I call the